Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Don. Um, my name is Kyle Tapaha. I'm uh, the co-chair here. Uh, this is uh, a commission meeting on July 13th. Um, thank you, everyone, who has shown uh, assigned into the meeting um, right now. Um, we have the welcome and call to order. Um, Thelma, can you do our roll call, please? Kyle Tapaha. Here. Uh, Commissioner Lloyd Lee. Uh, here. Uh, Commissioner Kim Benali. Here. Uh, Commissioner um, Marissa Naranjo. I'm here. Uh, Commissioner Raven Begay. Here. And did I miss anyone? Um, and then we have uh... Uh, Denise. I'm no longer um, a commissioner, so. Okay, so you are you a guest or something? Yes, I'm a guest. Attendee. Okay. <laughs> All right, and then we have absent uh, Lorenzo Jim, uh, Chair Rebecca Riley. Um, Commissioner Ron Martinez, Looking Elk, and, and Kim, Commissioner Kim Gleason. Is there anybody else that are absent? Um, Commissioner uh, Secretary. Secretary. Thank you. Okay, from my count, I have six. So we, we do, in fact, have quorum. Thank you. All right, uh, next on the agenda, we have uh, the invocation. Uh, may I get a volunteer to do our invocation, please? I will pick somebody now. <laughs> Former Commissioner Denise Zuni, would you perhaps be able to give our invocation for the evening since this is, uh, since last uh, meeting would, would have been your last? Would you be able to do that first? Yes, if that's allowable. Yes, please. That would be good. Okay. Wani kukim pawi nai kikawe ai ina poep umuche ina poep uyeche yuwai da ai wawa min ai ye wawa min mum ye ku wami mum kim pawi nai kikawe ai na kupi ani ke tuna mi di mi i eku i yuda na hong te kiwe mumi i na piyoshi na we pa che kim kawe ba kim na uyeche him ai kim na tai pa che him ai. Wani kukim kawe wana shahamu inshiki kia nimba kim kawe nba kim muya chiche. Thank you, Denise. We really appreciate that. Next on the agenda is the approval of uh, the meeting agenda. Um, Don has placed that link inside the chat. I'll give you a minute to look it over and uh, if we approve, then we'll, we'll approve the agenda. So we, do we have anything to add? Uh, I believe um, 
Commissioner Benali, uh, let's see. Oh, okay, you're, you're making a uh, presentation at the task force subcommittee at six. So I thought that was for us, I apologize. Okay, so it's not adding anything. All right. Has everybody had a chance to look over the agenda? Yeah, I, uh, this is uh, Lloyd. I uh, motion to approve the agenda. Um, I have one correction on the agenda. Um, let's see. On the commission sector reports and updates, it says commissioner commission um, Benali update report on art center subcommittee. I believe that's Commissioner Gleason, not me. I think the Kims got mixed up. All right, so Thelma, did you make that update? I apologize, Thelma, you're on a mute. All right, we'll go ahead and make that change to item 5B7, Commissioner Benali, and changing it to uh, Commissioner Gleason for the update on Arts Center Subcommittee. And then uh, before we do get that motion, can we change the, um, can we change from Commissioner Zuni under 5B1 to, to reflect uh, the new commissioner, uh, Ron Martinez looking out. Thelma, have you made that uh, change? Oh, Thelma? Oh, uh, yes, I, I noted it. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So can we get an, uh, uh, a motion to uh, approve the agenda with the change items? Uh, a motion to approve the agenda with the amendments. Thank you. Can we get a second? I'll second the motion. Second by Kim, Commissioner Bernal. All right, thank you. And then may I get a vote either in the chat? Dr. Lee, yes. Commissioner Antonio, yes. Commissioner Benali, yes. Commissioner Begay, yes. I vote yes as well. Uh, Thelma, Commissioner Antonio. Oh, you already got it. Who am I missing? Oh, uh, Commissioner Ron, oh. can I get your vote, please? Yeah. 
And I apologize, uh, Commissioner, was that a yes? Or on hold? Yes. Thank you. All right, so we got six yeses, five abstain. Motion passes. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, so now we have the uh, uh, approval of the April 13th meeting minutes. So does uh, Thelma, do you have that available for a screen share? The minutes yes, for um, uh, which uh, for April? April, yeah. Um, I'm trying to race to see if I have one too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If this is the one, let me see if I can screen share this. Are you able to see my screen now? Yes. So I'm gonna scroll down. Uh, and if there's any changes or this is just a review real quick, and then we'll do our uh, voting to approve the minutes. Section one, three commissioners left the meeting. Public comments. Now, our administrative matters. Sector reports. Uh, 
and adjourn. Do we have any uh, any changes, or should we move to approve these minutes from April thirteenth? Is everybody okay with the meeting minutes? Yes. All right, I'll stop sharing right now. All right, can I get somebody to motion to approve the minutes from April 13th, 2022? Uh, this is Marissa, I'll motion to approve. Thank you, Marissa. Can I get a second? This is Raven Begay in motion to approve. Thank you, Commissioner Begay. All right, if we could get the votes in the chat, please. Commissioner Benali, yes. Commissioner Naranjo, yes. Commissioner Dr. Lee, yes. Commissioner Antonio, yes. Commissioner Begay, yes. And myself, yes. Okay, motion passes 6-5. Thank you very much. So now, agenda is going. That's what we have. All right, uh, now we are on section four, new business. Uh, our community presenter, Tara Lee Massey, is not on our call. Um, so we'll just go ahead and move forward to 4B, public comment. Um, Terry, if, if we have Chief, any? Um, your presenter is here. I'm sorry? Your presenter is here. Oh, okay. Uh, I can't see. Oh. Commissioner Tapaha. Yes, here you go. I, um, we, I believe we still need to um, approve a maze minutes. Oh, okay. The, the agenda that I have. Um, that we approved does not have uh, May on it. Okay. Um, Mr. Nashbu, can we just add that to our next agenda since we don't have it here or how can we uh, correct this? Uh, Don, do you have any guidance on that? No, I think we have to go through with the agenda that was approved. Okay. If anyone else on the call, um, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I believe we do need to, to put it on the next agenda. The approved agenda did not have the May meeting minutes. Don's correct. Um, um, okay. So, um, uh, Commissioner Antonio, can we put that on our next agenda, please? Yes. Thank you. All right, um, let me go back a little. We do have our presenter. Um, if I could, um, Tara Lee Massey with Southwest Women's Law Center is making the presentation on childcare. So if you, if you may, um, I believe you can send, you can share your screen. Okay, thank you so much. Um, 
commissioners. Um, thank you everybody for having me today. I also have an intern um, with me. Her name is Erin Haggerty. I don't know if you're able to um, um, allow her to come in. Um, so let me go ahead and um, just introduce myself really quick before I go to the PowerPoint. Um, yet a, my name is Terrilyn Massey and I'm the executive director for the Southwest Women's Law Center. And um, our intern, her name is Erin Haggerty. And there she is. She is, um, um, well, I can have Erin introduce herself. Is that okay? All right. Hi all, my name is Erin Haggerty. As Terrilyn said, I am interning with the Southwest Women's Law Center this summer. I am a rising 2L uh, law student. Um, I attend Harvard Law School and I am in Albuquerque for the summer. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And um, yeah, um, this is actually Erin's last week in person here in um, Albuquerque. So she's gonna be working remotely um, in, um, on the East Coast. But um, thank you for having us. So we do have a PowerPoint presentation and I will go ahead and share that. Um, so um, just bear with me. Let me know if you can see it, please. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and just um, go ahead and um, just, well, just to let you know, this is a PowerPoint that we worked on um, this week and um, we have another meeting tomorrow. It's going to be with families and um, we were able to um, get um, a good number of people registered, but we wanted to um, use, use this PowerPoint today um, for our meeting with you because it is still relevant. And um, so, um, so we're testing it out as well. Um, so, but what I'm here to present about is the Child Care Next um, project that um, we're working on. Uh, the Southwest Women's Law Center uh, was recent, last was awarded last fall by the Alliance for Early Success um, and two, three other partners of ours uh, to work on child care policies in our state. Um, so six states across the country were selected and um, so New Mexico is one of them. And what the goals are is for the um, for us to listen, engage, and share leadership with people who are most affected by child care policies and systems, um, to advocate for transformative um, state policies and investments that will serve children, families, providers, and educators effectively and equitably, and also to build a sustainable base of political power in communities and states that will ensure progress is durable. These are really big goals. And what we decided as a team, um, this is a list of the team members, um, New Mexico Child Care and Education Association, Olay, New Mexico, Growing Up New Mexico are our partners and the state EC, ECD, Early Childhood Education Care Department is um, playing an advisory role. Um, so what we decided as a team is that we really wanted, want to be inclusive include um, um, the tribe, tribes and pueblos in our state, and also um, the Native Americans living off reservation, off of the Pueblo um, lands, and within um, the city of Albuquerque, or, um, um, you know, Grants, Gallup, just across the state, um, other towns. So that's what we, um, so we, we are intentional about reaching out um, to you and also to, um, um, to, to other stakeholders as well. So the, our project timeline under this grant is um, um, in this next slide, we are the, trying to finalize a childcare policy roadmap by September 1st. And we have been engaging in stakeholder meetings the past um, few months and we have been uh, meeting with many different um, groups, including child care providers, um, including tribes, um, tribal child care providers. Um, 
with um, coalitions, with um, parents and so forth. So we are getting feedback and um, what we're trying to do is um, put this into a document, a policy roadmap, roadmap document for our state. And we want to share this back out with, um, with some of the key stakeholders in August. And so that's what we're hoping to do. But by September 1st, we should have a draft plan. And our goal is going to be to finalize that and to implement that um, after September, like, you know, um, and next year. So that's just kind of like a rough timeline. So who are our partners besides the four, uh, five, organizations that I mentioned earlier. Um, our work is like we are engaging with families, with tribal child care professionals, other statewide early childhood professionals, um, the state of staff, um, New Mexico legislators, home-based child care providers, and so forth, so forth. So these are the different partners that we see in this work that we're doing. Um, so this is for tomorrow, but it, it's still relevant um, to you. Uh, what is the, our purpose for being here? Our purpose is to solicit input for our policy roadmap uh, from Native Americans who have used or are using childcare services for their children in New Mexico. Uh, I've done several one-on-one -on -one meetings with the tribes and Pueblos. Uh, so we're also, I'm also, we're also working on capturing some of that feedback from, um, from those um, respective um, positions. So our policy roadmap, there's going to be four major areas, um, workforce, affordability and access, quality and funding. These are the main areas that we see will be highlighted in our document. I'm only going to talk with the, uh, about a couple of these with you. Um, uh, so, um, so when we, I'm going to skip this slide because this is for our group tomorrow. We're going to have them do a poll. But in terms of um, what our vision is for workforce, um, you know, what we've been working really hard um, and talking and planning and trying to figure out how to do this is that we want to transform the, the child care workforce from low wage employees to being lifelong and esteemed professionals um, through li valuing lived experience and competencies, increasing um, compensation, and increasing professional higher education opportunities and pathways. We're hoping that when the state does this, that we will eliminate poverty wages, that there will be a more equitable wage and career lattice uh, for these professionals, and that there's gonna be, there will be permanent wage supplements. So what we are asking is um, for your input and how does this translate? You know, there may be um, parents here, um, you may have, you had used childcare in the past. So I just ask of you to draw upon those experience. Uh, maybe it's your family members or what, what could, um, you know, what services would have been, um, would have made your experience better or your family's experience better. So those are the kind of things that we're asking for. But in terms of, um, um, but specific to childcare workers, uh, you know, we one thing that we hear from this group is that they want to feel like they're revered and respected, that they're paid um, just uh, wages, that they are looked are seen as professionals. Uh, you know, that they are able to attain higher education um, and if they're able, if they can do that, like if the state can provide avenues to do that. So, um, so this, these are some of the things that we've heard. Um, but um, the other thing here is that the, some of the assumptions that we're making is that the, this professional pathway, um, like in terms of um, improving the workforce uh, in our state for childcare, is that it will include um, child, you know, there's a lot of uh, good work that's happening right now for teachers K through 12. 
But sometimes I think we forget about the early educators, the people who are taking care of our children from zero to five. So that's kind of like um, some of the areas that we're looking at, like how can we improve that, um, the, the, those roles, their, those skills, um, the, you know, the, their abilities to work with this um, young um, vulnerable population. So this is um, like um, some of the assumptions that we're making is that um, we're like automatically when the governor says that let's pay teachers more, some of us assume that includes those workforce, but you know, so it, and at times it does and sometimes it doesn't though. So what are the varied roles and responsibilities uh, like in terms of um, salaries, like um, we're assuming that they work full time, full year employment, um, but sometimes um, from what we're learning is that it can be, um, this can be the case, but sometimes it may just be, you know, like part time or limited time that people are working. So these are just some of the assumptions that that this child care workforce are dealing that we're dealing with that we're trying to address. And there's a little bit more here, but I'm not going to go into those details right now. Um, so my question for you um, is that um, we have this um, for those um, I know the commission here, most of you are probably living here in the Albuquerque area or in near, near, near nearby communities. But, um, you know, are there particular workforce challenges facing the child care providers um, that are operating off of tribal or Pueblo lands? Like, have you, do you see any of those type of issues? What is your experience? So if, if you have any thoughts about that, um, please um, go ahead and just, you can shout it out or you can um, put it in the chat box. Um, and so Aaron is helping me take um, some notes as well. So, so I'm gonna go back to that slide. So, and this might be a little bit of a harder question because it is for childcare, but there is gonna be one um, that I'm gonna ask you to look at for families. So that's more targeted for families. I'm not able to see everybody's face so or um, screens, but I'm not seeing too much. Um, but so this is a question that we will ask um, the individuals who will be uh, participating tomorrow. Um, so this is going to be one that um, we're going to ask for those who are living on the reservations, if there's particular challenges facing child care workforce um, in tribal communities. Uh, similar, um, so this is just a follow up question to that, but I'm going to go ahead and um, move on to the next area, unless I'm missing someone. Kyle, I just see you. So, so just like let me know if there's a um, if I'm missing something or um, if I'm missing a person, uh, a commissioner, or maybe another participant. No, no, you're doing well. Um, this was a, a presentation to to us as well too. So okay, um, and then All right. um, we'll be able to record this in our meeting. All right, thank you. So the second area, um, and this is where I think most people are impacted, um, it, which is the affordability, quality, and access. Our goal, our vision is to increase equitable access to high quality childcare that is culturally responsive and built on the strengths of our caregivers and broader communities. So this is a vision that we identified. So what are the principles regarding affordability and access? Um, so we think that every family should have access to the child care provider and the setting of their choice, that providers in all settings and all communities are an important part of the child care ecosystem and deserve support to provide care in culturally and linguistic, linguistically meaningful ways. The state and federal government have a role to play in bridging the gap between the actual cost of care and what families can afford. The subsidy system must be easy to navigate 
and create a consistent revenue stream for providers. The cost of childcare should be affordable and based on a family's household income. Subsidy rates must reflect the actual cost of providing care. Reducing administrative burdens is a critical component to ensuring that families and childcare providers can use, utilize the system. Providers need more supports and resources to establish, sustain, and grow their businesses. Considerations should ensure access during non-traditional hours for those with limited access to transportation, particularly for low-income rural frontier tribal and BIPOC communities. So these are the principles that we identified. Um, so um, our question for you is, um, again, asking you to draw on your, your experience or that of your family um, members or other um, persons that you, who you may know. What, was, what is the most interesting about these principles? Does anything here concern you? Um, and what is missing? So I'm gonna take a moment here. I don't know if, I'm, if anyone is able to unmute themselves or. Um, this is, uh, sorry, uh, Terry Lynn, this is uh, uh, Lloyd Lee. Uh, yeah. I, on this part here, um, I'm wondering if you have, have, people have talked about transportation issues. Um, you know, there's a possibility that people won't be have, won't have the ability to go to childcare or to drop them off. Um, and because of a variety of different reasons, but I'm wondering if that, that has come up. You're actually the first person that is raising it for um for this um, particular group um so yes um, so oh, okay. for that. yeah we have heard it in with other stakeholders um but in terms of like native americans I, i'm i'm glad to say thank you for bringing that up and um, for off reservation native american communities uh you know i think we take it for granted um you know, that we think everyone has transportation, can easily get in a car, just go down to that childcare center a couple miles away, drop off their children. But um, yeah, um, but, but that doesn't happen all the time. So thank you. So you're saying that's really valuable and should be addressed in some way? Um. Well, I think in some way, yeah, I, I'm just wondering because, uh, you know, the, the thing areas that you're highlighting here, choice, cultural and linguistically meaningful, easy to navigate, affordable, more supports. I think those are definitely very important. Um, I'm just wondering about the possibility of, uh, of transportation and, and other, other access um, that, you know, some people may say, well, you know, I have to get my relative to help me or I have to get someone to help me, a friend or an acquaintance or somebody to get childcare or something, or I just don't have the time to do that because I'm working constantly, you know, I have two or three jobs and, um, you know, it's just sort of those types of things that may come up for, I don't know how many individuals would, would have that or no statistics surrounding that, how many would need that, maybe it just be a very small number. Um, but it's something that that may come up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for raising those issues, and lifting them up for us. So let me see. So some of the other affordability and access considerations um, is regarding like, um, like how do we remove barriers uh, for families? And um, so some of the, what we've heard is that the state should link 
data systems across state departments to flag eligibility for child care assistance for families. Um, like, for example, if someone applies for SNAP benefits, um, you know, and they're approved, like that information should go to um, ECECD somehow and say, like, this person got approved for SNAP. It looks like they may be eligible for childcare, how, um, you know, like follow up with them type of thing. And they have like two kids. So that's kind of like one of the recommendation. Um, some of the bar barriers that we've heard in the past is that everything is siloed. And so people have to go to different office to give different government offices um, to apply for these different um, benefits. Um, the other is permanently eliminating co-pays or capping out-of-pocket costs at 7% of household income. Uh, so uh, just, you know, I think there's been some recent moves that the governor is um, doing on this. Uh, like you might have seen the commercials where she's saying like, you know, um, you can get child care if you're at 400 federal poverty level right now. Um, so, and like, you don't have to, uh, families don't have to pay. Like, I don't know if you've, you've seen those commercials, but, um, but that's temporarily, that's, that's what they're doing temporarily. Um, so it, it's not permanent. Um, so just want to kind of point out that the other is, um, you know, for those of us who speak, um, who have English as our second language, uh, we also think about like, you know, um, getting care in our language in like Navajo or maybe Tewa or um, Towa. So there's just other languages um, we think about, you know, that would be good to have um, available. Um, and this is like really recommendations that um, we're gonna put together, we're, we are gonna share with our funder, but we are also gonna share with the state and with the state of New Mexico. And we can say, there, you know, the commission said this, or um, the Native American stakeholder group that we heard from, like they, this is important to them. Um, so there's just there's there's leeway there um, in the designing um, better services for families, and that's kind of where we're trying to get that input from uh, for from you. Um, so. And then the other possible solutions, uh, re remove administrative barriers and improve supports for providing non-traditional hour care. So this could be for um, individuals who work after 6 p.m. and work at midnight or CNAs, um, you know, uh, people who work in the um, emergency uh, rooms or hospitals or provide care at senior centers, not senior centers, but senior homes, Homes, um, so just different places like that. Um, when you, you know, we have people who work um, in those the non traditional settings. Um, and then subsidy rates for infant and toddler care fully cover the cost of care, include transportation funding and child care subsidy rates. Uh, so these are just some of the considerations. And we wanted to hear from you is there something that we're, um, what is the main concern or access challenges for children living um, off of tribal lands um, that you know about? Or like, are those pretty much kind of captured, do you think, for our Native families? Hi, this is Raven Begay. I actually uh, work with a lot of individuals or women that do have a lot of those issues that you presented. So I think you kind of captured on everything. I can't think of anything else because a lot of times those are the big issues about transportation, the affordability, even having the access to childcare are getting there. So I do think you touch on a lot of those barriers there for a lot of women. Great. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. But you know, you know, sometimes like um, we, we just don't want to forget something important. And that's where like this feedback is really helpful. So thank you. And then um, what another question that um, both Aaron and I, we've read this um, report. Um, it's focused at the national level on looking at child care um, that's being provided by the tribes. Um, um, 
And um, so we read this report and um, this report also talks about how the states can better support those tribes. And one of the areas that this report um, recognized where the state could do this is by providing more access to culturally um, responsive childcare services. And we both thought that, that was really interesting. I thought it, we thought it was a really good point and um, a, a good recommendation that um, came out of this report. So that's kind of, um, so that's kind of um, where we're at now is like, do you, does the commission or do you see this as a important um, service that should be added or that should be better supported? Um, what, what do you all think? I mean, for our native families that are um, living off reservation, so. Yeah, this is uh, Lloyd again. Um, yeah, I think it's important. Um, you know, I think since we know about, oh, 70 to 75 percent of Native people live in cities and urban areas around the country now, mm -hmm. um, many of them don't have access to culturally relevant knowledge from their community. So in different ways, either through the school system or through childcare or through, through other means, I think having them have the ability to access that is important. So that's whether that's cultural camps, language nest programs, um, classes, um, you know, those types of things, those I think are, are important. I think they want them. Uh, because they're, even though I think many of them have ties back to their home communities, there's a variety of different reasons they're not able to go back on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. And so having access to it in, in cities and urban areas, I think is very important. Um, and I think, so this, this um, culturally responsive child care service, I think really will in, in be very much warranted. In, in a way that they can have access to that. Yeah, the, there's a question I have, and I don't know if this was um, part of this particular section, um, but uh, how, for particularly for New Mexico, um, you know, the this particular policy, how would it tie itself to the Martinez Yazi uh, education decision? Um, and what the responsibility of New Mexico public education is to Native American students. Um, is, is there, has there been discussion on that with this particular uh, approach that you've taken and with, with the, the policy that's going to be developed? No, we, to be honest, we have not um, looked at um, this from, with that perspective in mind, but that's a really great idea um, to do that. So we, so um, that hasn't been brought up before, but um, yeah, so I will um, take that um, back and see, um, you know, how it's impacted, so to speak, but okay. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. Anyone else? I'm not missing anyone. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lee. And let me see. So uh, another follow-up question is like, you know, what are um, the outcomes that are important to you in your child care settings for your love, for your family, for your children, grandchildren, or, you know, your relative? Are there any outcomes that you think we're missing? I think we answered this earlier, but I just want to make sure one more time. I feel like Terry wants to say something, but he's holding back. Okay. Um, all right. Um, but I think that's the last thing um, that we have going on. Um, so uh, I do just want to offer um, if you're, I don't know if this is allowable or anything like that, um, Kyle, 
uh, so I'll defer to you. But we are um, offering a $50 um, incentive to our participants and to um, for, for these um, for this PowerPoint for this presentation. So if it is allowable, um, I can send you the forms um, that we were asking people to um, complete and provide. So back to me. So. Yeah, um, I do not believe we are allowed to uh, receive any comp compensation. Um, okay. So we, we are happy to, to offer space to, to listen to the community. And these are very important issues to, to our people. So um, it, it, is, it is our pleasure to, to be able to talk with you and uh, for, for issues like this to be brought up uh, to the city's attention. This, this is just usually just what, what okay. our people are working on. So um, though I, we, we appreciate the offer, um, right. you know, I, I do not think we will be able to, to do that. Um, I can get confirmation from, from Don, but yeah, other, other than that, the, that was a really great, great presentation. Um, thank you, Terrilyn. Thank you, Aaron, for providing us that information and give, providing the opportunity for the commission to make make a few comments. Um, but yeah, it's really great work that you guys are doing, and I'm very happy you guys made it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate your comments, your questions, and to and for listening to us too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we did have um, Commissioner Benali uh, exit the meeting just a few minutes ago. Uh, she should be back here pretty soon. Um, so I think uh, let's see if it would be okay to give time for uh, for a business, new business under a section four B public comment. Uh, since we are done with the community presenter portion. Um, Terry, do we have any public comment? Uh, Commissioner Tapa, we do not have any public comments that I received. Yeah, I've, I've been sending out the, the little notes to have people contact you. I did a few outreach events and um, yeah, the people are very interested in the work that we are doing as a commission, but um, I think we just need to strongly encourage people to make public comments. So yeah, I've been I've been giving out your your email address. So hopefully somebody soon will be able to to uh, send us something. All right. Um, so let's see, are we able to to move on to four C without um, Commissioner Benali present, Don? This is approving, approving new action items, but I haven't seen any from Commissioner Riley. I believe Don stepped away. Okay. Um, yeah, at this point, there's no uh, quorum. Quorum? Yeah. So yeah, so she said, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Bonali said she needed about 20 minutes to, um, to, to attend to something else and then she'll be right back. So um, if I were to make an update for uh, the Albuquerque Public School Indian Education Department response, um, my, my update is, um, so the NLC um, had sent a letter um, to, uh, Superintendent Elder, and I got a response um, that that Friday that I emailed him, um, and I did send a note uh, to the NLC saying that uh, Superintendent Scott Elder received our letter and confirmed APS is moving forward with hiring a senior director of Indian Education Program before the upcoming school year. So that that is my my report, and I don't have any follow up. Um, any follow-up um, action items other other than just uh, informing the the commission that we we did get a response. He did call me, and um, he said that they are working on it. So um, I thank the commission for uh, the support letter um, the, that the commissioner Riley had put together, and 
we approved and sent off. Um, I still have not been able to have any further discussions with the parent committee, the Indian parent committee. Um, but the NLC did send their letter and we did we did get a, a, a response. So I just wanted to, to mention that. So um, I believe I'll be able to get with uh, uh, Commissioner Riley to see if there's any anything else that we need to do um, and, and put those action items up for the next meeting for for approval. But as it stands right now, I don't I don't have anything. To do. Does anybody have any other comments about the uh, APS? Superintendent position, or I'm sorry, the uh, senior director position. The only comment was I did see the advertisement for the position, um, and I don't, I, I believe there was deadline was in June, right? End of June or something. Uh, yes, Commissioner. Sure. Yeah, the, so the, yeah, that was uh, I, I sent out a. A job vacancy that they did repost. So, so they they were listening, and I believe they were making uh, their moves to to get this uh, somebody hired. So yeah, okay. I did see that. That was nice. All right. Yeah, we'll just I guess have to wait and see what happens. Thank you. Uh, any other commissioner comment for? Uh, Discussion of four C. All right, yeah. Uh, so just I'll, I'll follow up with Commissioner Riley to see if there's any other action items, and we'll make sure to get that out to the to the rest of the commission so that they're um, apprised of the situation and if there's anything that we need. Um, Terry since Dawn is away from her uh, keyboard. Um, the next on the agenda is a break if needed. Um, may we use this time to wait for uh, Commissioner Benali to return? Uh, Commissioner Taba, just to let you know, Dawn is back. Oh, Dawn is back. Okay, I apologize. Uh, I, I'm using a, a Linux version of Zoom, so it does look a little different. Commissioners, would we be able to take a few minute break to, to, to allow uh, Commissioner Benali to return? That's fine by me. That's good with me too. Commissioner Antonio says yes. Okay. Um, Commissioner Naranjo? Yes, that's fine with me. Okay. All right. Uh, may we take a break for about, let's say, let's say about 10 minutes. And that, should, that should be plenty of time. Would that be okay, Don? Yeah, we will return at um, 623. 623. Welcome back, commissioners. Uh, welcome back, Terry, Don, um, and Don. Um, so, a uh, small update: uh, Commissioner Begay had to step away uh, from the meeting, so uh, we do not have quorum when uh, Commissioner Benali returns. So, um, with uh, permission, we start to restart on our meeting. Uh, we are at number five. A city of Albuquerque updates. Uh, Don, when you are ready. Thank you, Commissioner Tapaha. Um, the city of Albuquerque, we did complete our tribal consultation regarding the Albuquerque Indian School Cemetery at 4 H Park on Thursday, June 23rd. Um, we are waiting for a final report um, to be submitted through our contractors through Parks and Rec Department. 
from there, we will use this information to um, continue our consultation with the tribes that were not present. Um, and um, once we have a consensus or have got more input from the tribal members, we will then move on to um, meetings with community and additional stakeholders. Um, that is in our forecast for the planning for the 4-H park. Um, let's see. We are continuing to work with the Family and Community Services Department. So the Gateway Center, which will be a new um, emergency housing unit at the Gibson Medical Facility, is um, in progress and they're hoping to have a spring 2023 opening and we've been working with them to to ask like how is the city of albuquerque going to address working uh providing services and resources specifically for the urban native community or the unsheltered native community as they're the least um overrepresented they're the most overrepresented but the least served in terms of homeless and housing services um, so we are working with them on that as well as some of the commission members here um, housing related, the city of Albuquerque is continuing to work with uh, Mass Design Group and Mass Design is conducting a survey right now uh, with community and different uh, businesses and service providers to identify needs and preferences of Black and Native American potential homeowners. Um, so the information was shared. If you do have time, please take the survey and also share with your networks. Um, our office is also working, continuing to work with the Albuquerque Police Department, the State of New Mexico Indian Affairs Department, as well as the um, FBI to continue our MMIWR initiatives. Right now, the FBI, they have a new um, division that's going to specifically focus on creating a database that will provide a more comprehensive overview of um, missing persons. And they will be offering a training um, sometime in the fall. And so we are working with their office on um, kind of coordinating that event. Um, another event that we had was when was it June 28th and 29th, right? <laughs> My dates are okay. <laughs> we yeah, had 30th. a housing affair, 29th and 30th. Yeah, there's so many things that happened. Um, so we were able to, uh, we had our tribal housing and home fair. We were able to have 40 different um, local and tribal housing providers or housing support service attend and over 600 participants, um, over 200 emergency rental assistance applications uh, were submitted and Navajo Nation did um, mention that they submitted over 50 section eight housing applications or they received over 50 housing applications. So um, in our McKinley Bento Title I project um, also saw 20 different families that were experiencing homelessness. Um, so the event was um, a really good event and I think it provided a critical need to our community. We are in the process of planning for a tribal housing summit um, in October. We are wanting to do it, I believe on October 11th, the day after Indigenous Peoples Day. And um, the goal would be to really look at some of the things that we learned through COVID, um, how they amplified a lot of the dysfunction or a lot of um, the inequities our housing systems play. Um, so we want to kind of like, what are some of the lessons learned? What is our current situation and how can we improve uh, systems navigation between services here in Albuquerque and also on um, the tribal, on tribal nations. So we are in the process of planning for that uh, and we have sent out some save the dates. So we're hoping to have more information before the end of this month. Um, and lastly, we are also looking at um, 
<clears throat> excuse me, um, what are we wanting to do for November for the Native American Heritage Month? So um, now would be a great time to kind of show interest and see what is the planning process. Um, we have been forecasting with the mayor's office that we do as a city want to host an annual um, Native American Heritage Day or event to kick off November, the first Saturday of every month and make it an annual event. And so we're definitely going to be needing community input to community participation in the planning process. Um, so I just want to put that onto the forecasting piece. And I'll go ahead to, to turn it over to Mr. Sloan uh, for any additional updates. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, just to add a few more comments on the uh, tribal consultation. We had um, the Navajo Nation represented, the Pueblo Zuni represented, Ute Mountain Ute Tribe represented, um, Isleta Pueblo was represented, and the Pueblo of Laguna and the Pueblo of Santa Ana were represented, uh, where we had uh, Santa Ana governor and lieutenant governor in attendance. And then for Ute Mountain Ute was chairman, um, um, Manuel Hart was in also in attendance. And then from Zuni, we had a councilman, um, Arlen uh, Zate or Kate. <laughs> um, so it was very, a very successful, I believe, tribal consultation. We got a lot of information on, on what the next steps and what they would like us to do. Uh, what, what, what we're planning on doing from the uh, report out of the consultation, we had two work, we had two um, uh, breakout sessions. And so we're, we're gonna be both combining reports from those workout session, work sessions. And then we'll then be, be preparing a report which we'll send to the tribes and the tribal leaders uh, to take a look at, provide us any feedback or thoughts or comments on it. And then we'll ask for an approval of this report and we'll then take that report to be utilized to the, uh, for the next steps when we, work, when we, when we begin to put together the working group, which will then create a strategic plan on our on what we will do with 4-H Park. And that strategic plan will include uh, the community, uh, relatives, families, tribes, uh, and stakeholders, and anybody that wants to be a part of this uh, working group. So th that will be the next steps as we move forward. And of course, we may hold additional tribal consultations um, just to further get additional information or clarification on the tribes that were not able to attend. Um, we did get offers from uh, two tribes to host our next tribal consultation. So we might be holding it at, at Ute Mountain or else at Santa Ana Pueblo have offered to um, host the next tribal consultation. Uh, but we got great information. Mayor Keller was there, he provided opening remarks and a statement on, on the work and his thoughts uh, on what uh, the cemetery and what the Albuquerque Indian School represented. And he also provided a, a, an apology for the city's role in the park itself to the tribal leaders. And, but again, we'll keep you apprised of that. We, uh, we were blessed to have Rebecca Riley and, and, Counts, and Commissioner uh, Thelma Antonio in attendance who provided and participated in the consultation working with the tribal leaders. Uh, and then, and additionally on a couple more items on the um, Albuquerque Native Housing and Home Fair, which we call Protecting Our Families, Protecting Our Homes. Um, we initially had invited about nine uh, tribally designated housing entities, and we did have four that showed up. We had, uh, uh, Tohajle Navajo Housing Authority, uh, the San Domingo Tribal Housing Authority, the Tamaya uh, Housing Incorporated, and then we had Laguna Housing Development and Management Enterprise, which was there. And then the goal was really to assess and provide um, assistance in preparing emergency rental assistance applications for particularly the RDNA relatives, but also for other tribal representatives. And what we did find out is several of the tribes 
uh, particularly Laguna, their latest round of emergency rental assistance was inclusive of all tribes in the United States. So it wasn't, it wasn't particular to just their tribal members, but they can assist any tribe. So we had a lot of our um, attendees that came that if their tribe wasn't there, they were able to go and speak with Laguna and, and talk to them about getting assistance, which we did help them with. Um, and then we also had uh, section 184 was there to help provide assistance and information on uh, how housing purchases and uh, getting a loan or housing down payment assistance. We had uh, Presbyterian Healthcare, we had Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield, we had YDI, we had Youth Group Wings of America, um, and so forth that were part of our overall group. And then we also had city departments there, uh, Family and Community Services, our Health Services Department, and then our team that provides rental assistance uh, and utilities assistance was also there. And I believe over the two days, we probably saw around 500 people come through and visit um, a lot. We're very uh, appreciative of the what we were providing. We what we were the goal was to provide like a one stop shop for this for this um, particular event, and uh, so it was very well pretty close to that. You know, we almost had everybody there. We were hoping, um, but we did learn a lot on our next next steps for the next uh, housing summit, which Don uh, mentioned earlier. And then also what was really great was that uh, First Nations Community Health Source really came through and providing assistance on, on, on completing and, and processing applications, uh, particularly Ms. Veronica Johnson was very uh, hardworking and like 10 hours a day, um, getting things together for the, uh, our Diné relatives and other tribal members. Um, and we had food, of course, and it was a very nice, uh, setting that we created because the goal was also to create a safe space for pe pe people needing help and needing assistance and you know not shaming them for being there and making them feel bad but we wanted to to make them feel welcome to come and get help get assistance and so it, it was it was a broader issue too because we had groups people come in that needed help right away uh, where they're actually living in their car with children and so we were, we were able to get them housing vouchers that day. And so I think, believe they were able to get some housing that night or for the next couple of days after that with hotel vouchers. And then we were, we were able to get them additional guidance on where to go next to get potential housing assistance uh, for a long-term basis. Um, and we did reach out to HUD. HUD SWANAP uh, will help, will be a part of our housing summit coming up. Uh, we did. Uh, contact all our congressional delegation. Um, we had uh, Teresa Ledger Fernandez's representatives come to uh, our Thursday event. And so they were able to visit with us, talk about the issues and, and go around and to talk to some of the participating groups that were there. Uh, ben Ray Lujan's team was supposed to be there, but of course, but unfortunately they couldn't make it, but they, they did call me and apologize that they couldn't make it, but they want to be part of our next housing summit. Uh, same thing with, um, Senator Heinrich and um, Congresswoman uh, Melanie Stansbury's team. So we'll, we'll be looking at a broader event. Again, we'll be, having, we'll, we'll, we'll be inviting tribal leaders and of course all the TDHEs, which are tri tri tribally designated housing entities around Albuquerque and then within the state to also participate in that event. And that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> um, Terry, this is Kyle. Um, yeah, well, actually not a question. So I did um, have a message sent to me. Um, some one, one person had mentioned that uh, toward the end of the event, most of the uh, providers had left and they just wanted to leave a comment that she um, had to drive or had to get an Uber to make it to the event, but still didn't, didn't see a lot of the providers. So. Uh, that's just something that that came across the desk, but yeah, it was it was really good to see at the housing home and housing fair the amount of people that were coming in, getting all the useful information. And I did overhear a couple of situations of immediate need, um, and and um, I believe they were they were trying to get their, their them situated. So um, thank you, Don. Thank you, Terry, for 
for putting that together. Um, I did see that um, it, it was very respectful from from the beginning, and you know that the intent and um, that the people utilizing um, the resources are there. So um, we do want to invite uh, you know, other other commissions, other government entities to an event like this. So um, uh, did we have um, the save the date set for uh, the next summit? Yes, it's October 11th. Okay. And we're, we're also anticipating having it at the convention center. Okay. And also commissioners, I would like to commend uh, Commissioner uh, Kyle Tapaha for his work and participation at the event. He was a great ambassador for the city, but also for the Commission on American Indian and Alaska Native Affairs. And he, he got around and talked to everybody, was held, held his ground at the table and met with the various uh, uh, I guess leaders of the city that came through, leaders of the na of native groups, and so it was. He was very well received, and he did a great job. So thank you. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, it, it was it was really good to see that many people come together, and um, um, I heavily promoted the commission. Um, people people did do still do don't know we're here, so we need to do a little bit more promotion. Um, getting getting our um, organization and our, our mission and vision out to the to the public, uh, but yeah, thank thank you very much for that, Terry. Very well appreciate it. Thank you, Don, as well. Uh, the next uh, uh, up on the agenda five B is the Commission sector reports and updates. Um, we have uh, let's see, uh, Government and Tribal Representative Commissioner Antonio. Do you have any updates? I do not have any updates at this time. And then we, under the updated uh, agenda item, we have uh, the change from uh, Commissioner Zuni to Commissioner Martinez uh, looking out. Uh, so my my update, uh, is, Denise, are you there? Hi, I'm here. Uh, I'm here. Um, no updates other than to say that um, Ron is very excited to serve on the commission. So he should be at the next meeting. I, I will I will track him down. Okay, and I enjoyed working with all of you and keep up the good work, everyone. Thank you, uh, Denise. Um, so on behalf of the commission, we wanted to send you a very big thank you uh, for being a part of the commission, for showing dedication and support to all communities here in New Mexico. So Denise, thank you very much. Um, I, I know at our our last in-person meet, we were at the uh, ribbon cutting. So I do have that picture and I'll, I'll share it with the commission. And um, again, just from, from the bottom of my heart and with every, every commissioner here present, um, just thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for being part of discussion, conversations, bringing up what we want to that, that you think is important to our community. And you know, Denise, you embodied that. So I can thank you. Thank you very much for, for being a part of it. And we're looking forward to, to seeing you at our, our meetings again as, as, a, as a, a community member. So thank you, continue, continue being safe and well. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Tapa, I also would like to thank uh, Commissioner, former Commissioner um, Denise Suni. It was a pleasure working with you and uh, on behalf of the city, thank you. Your, your contributions and your work was invaluable and you will be missed. And, um, but feel free to let us know anything, any thoughts, ideas. You're welcome to public comment with me if you want, of course. And then uh, again, you're invited and welcome to attend any other further meetings with any ideas or thoughts that you may have. And, and of course, anything you wanna provide input from the tribe would be fantastic. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for everyone. It was nice working with all of you. Thank you very much, Denise. Yeah, thank you, Denise, very much. <clears throat> it's great working with you. Uh, the next 5B1 education. Dr. Lee, do you have any updates? Um, <clears throat> no, well, yeah, there's... Uh, there is the New Mexico Public Education Department, along with 
the Institute for American Indian Education at UNM and the Native American Studies Program. Uh, we have been hosting these virtual Zoom training opportunities. And so there are three additional training opportunities at the end of this month and early August. Um, let me see if you can see my screen here. Um, so uh, there's one on uh, July 28th <clears throat> on sustained learning anti-racism. These are short um, online training sessions, 90 minutes. Um, <clears throat> the second session is on Friday, July 29th at 9 a.m., uh, Sustained Learning the History of Indigenous Peoples. Um, and then the third is, uh, what is the linguistic landscape and its importance for our New Mexico students? This is on August 3rd. And I believe this is at 10 a.m. <clears throat> So uh, the New Mexico Public Education Department has this on their, on their website, as well as the Institute for American Indian Education. So if you're interested, this is open to not, only, not just educators, but to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, so this is all online, it's free, mm -hmm. you just need to register. <clears throat> That's the only update I have, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. If, there's a, if you are able to, can you send that to me? I'd like to send that out to my networks as well. Okay. And then we could definitely put the link into our, our many minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, next is 5B, let's see, 3, uh, Commissioner Jim is not available. B4, uh, Chair uh, Riley is not available. Commissioner Begay signed off. Again, a reminder that we don't we don't have quorum um, environment. Five B six. Commissioner Naranjo, do you have any updates? Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I just wanted to give the commission an update and overview of the New Mexico fifty-year water plan. Um, that's currently being developed by the Office of the State Engineer and Interstate Stream Commission. It does have an accompanying um, tribal water report and set of tribal water recommendations that um, I and Lori Loyaki as a uh, contractor through the Indian Affairs Department have been working on in consultation with um, tribes and pueblos um, across the state to contribute to this. Um, so I just wanted to provide a quick overview. Um, as you all might know, as I mentioned, um, so. Uh, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham last year had called for the Office of the State Engineer and Interstate Stream Commission to um, serve as the lead agencies to develop the state's fifth year water plan. Um, and the plan will serve as kind of a high level summary to inform uh, policymakers on how to best prepare for the impacts of climate change on our water resources over the next 50 years. So um, the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources had convened a team of New Mexico scientists to, com to compile um, research, technical reports, and data sets that really examine how climate change will impact our water resources in the state. Uh, this assessment is um, called the Leap Ahead Analysis, and it provides the foundation for the 50-year water plan. And that Leap Ahead Analysis, if anybody is interested, is available on the New Mexico Bureau of Geology's website, and I can put the link in the chat also. Um, but to ensure the inclusion of um, our tribal nations and Pueblo nations in development of the 50-year water plan, the OSC and ISC had requested support from the IAD, the Indian Affairs Department, to um, provide that. So IAD had responded to, by creating a tribal water work group um, in September of this year. And at IED's request, um, tribal leaders have sent designees to serve on this tribal water work group in an advisory capacity. Um, so the work group has consisted of uh, really a, div a diverse group, including tribal water technical experts, hydrologists, natural resource professionals, uh, tribal historic preservation officers, cultural leaders, um, all of who have really provided a lot of guidance and technical expertise in serving their respective tribes on water issues. Um, so we've been meeting with the Tribal Water Work Group um, since September 2021 and gathering information um, 
and gathering recommendations to be incorporated into a tribal water report instead of recommendations. And we just had our um, last tribal water work group um, last month and we've been um, drafting and uh, finalizing the report to submit to you both the Interstate Stream Commission and the Office of, uh, the Office of State Engineer and the Indian Affairs Department. Um, but I just wanted to let you all know where we kind of were in that process and I'm happy to share the report as soon as it's finalized and submitted and reviewed um, by all of the agencies and I think it'll, it's going to have um, broad implications for both um, you know, at, the, at the municipal level, at the, both at the local level, at the county level and at the state level. Um, there's a set of, I think it was 13 recommendations that we had landed on that actually intersect um, different governments within the state. So. Um, Really excited to share that with you all and move some of the recommendations forward into implementation, um, including those that are specific to the city of Albuquerque. Thank you, Commissioner Naranjo. Yeah, um, if there's a way, maybe you'd like to do a small presentation of, of findings and, and if there's anything that the commission can help with, we could definitely put that on the next agenda. Thank you, that sounds great. Thank you. All right, uh, next one, 5B7 are the at-large members, which is comprised of myself, Commissioner Gleason, who's not available, and Commissioner Benalla. So um, for my updates, um, I've been working um, with, um, let's see, working, uh, doing some outreach. So I was at the state of the city uh, with the mayor and just providing support. Just I did a table event there. It was really nice. Uh, sent out some information. Um, I was also at the tribal housing um, or, or the housing event that uh, uh, Mr. Sloan had mentioned. Um, so handing out more information about the commission. Um, as well as you know the, the the free internet services that uh, we are signing up through AIO to qualified native families, and I'll, I'll send a link and I'll put that um, in our, our next meeting minutes. Um, one of the things that I've been helping out with is doing some awareness for New Mexico Crisis Line. So um, if you follow me on Facebook or you follow AIO, um, we've been doing a lot of uh, awareness for the number 988, which is similar to 911, 911 being for emergency, 988 goes live on the 16th uh, this Saturday, and um, our communities across the nation will be able to dial 988 to get in touch with their local crisis center. So um, we, we've been doing that. Um, there is a NLC meeting. Well, let me, let me do the background of it. So there is a, a third Thursday meeting at AIO, uh, third Thursday luncheon on September, or July 21st um, at noon. And our guest will be Warlance Chi. He is uh, the CEO of Saab Kiriria, and he'll be talking about uh, their, their exciting news of moving and opening up a new uh, facility um, in Northeast Albuquerque. Uh, we have the Native Leadership Collective meeting on J July 27th. We invited Sarah Barbara from NACA to talk about uh, APS, um, some of their, their, um, uh, their um, I can even say their, their processes, uh, getting, getting the community to, to see how APS operates and um, seeing how the commission can, can better um, assist with that. Uh, I've been doing outreach to the Asian community as well. Um, pretty soon AIO will be talking about getting out to vote. So we are just uh, gearing up partners. Um, I'm going to be uh, reaching out again to the, to the Black community as well, the community engagement team there. Um, but yeah, those are, those are some of the, some of the updates that I'm working on right now. Um, Next is Commissioner Benali. Do you have any updates? Um, no, not right now. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. So then, uh, so we did change the uh, the agenda to reflect that uh, Commissioner Blight, uh Commissioner Gleason was uh, doing an update on the report, but unfortunately she was not able to attend. 
So that is the end of our agenda. We do have uh, the next item. Do we have any other comments? Do we miss anything? Commissioner uh, Tabaha, uh, what was that crisis hotline number again? Um, so the year, on July 16th, you'll be able to dial 988 from your phone to get in touch with the New Mexico crisis line. So that just, is this a shortcut? Um, to, to get to the, the, the hotline. The, the regular number I think was a two six or two seven three talk. That's a national line, but yeah, we will have access to a local crisis line. So, but 988 is the number. Thank you. Uh, oh, and if, well, let's add, I apologize. Let me add on the URL for more information, 988nm.org. So that's the website that gives more information about that. <clears throat> Should have wrote that down. <clears throat> okay. All right. Is, is there any other comments? Just a quick question for Don and Terry. Um, you know, the Navajo Nation has its presidential election taking place. And so after the primary on August 2nd, there'll be a general election with the two candidates. And so I know that the students may want to organize something at UNM in terms of a debate. Would the would the office of of the city be able to um, support that, or do you have to stay out of that <laughs> as a yeah. pop political? I think we'll have to double check. Um... I do know that we are not able to endorse or support any specific candidate. Um, however, you know, this isn't necessarily an endorsement. It would be more of a town hall piece. So um, if we can get the specific request, you know, like that the city, like what, what would be the ask of the city when you ask for help? What does that mean? Would it be technical support? Would it be communications outreach? Um, once we have a clear ask, then we can forward it on to, to the mayor's office or to our directors here in OEI. Oh, well, I, I'm thinking it's gonna be just getting the word out communication because I think they're going to set it up at UNM. Um, they'll, you know, the, for them, for a student organization, it's, it's very simple and it's free. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm pretty sure whoever the two candidates are, they're willing to come and talk to the students. But I think <clears throat> the other thing would be try to get as many people from this to the Albuquerque area, um, you know, to come to that particular debate or town hall um, to see this. So I guess getting the word out would be my uh, perspective in this. I mean, it's totally going to be up to them, uh, you know, when, when they meet in August, when they come back, when the fall semester starts. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking it's just going to be communication, nothing else. Okay. In terms of comms, it is my understanding that any type of community events that happened, we can definitely promote that through our, any of our social media accounts. Now, if we were to use additional resources like press releases or like the comms official channels in terms of like the TVs or things like that, those would use, or to post on the website, those would need to be official city sponsored or city hosted events. So in terms of this one, it sounds like we would be able to assist with the promotion through social media, because um, we do that for all community events and it's not endorsing one candidate or anything like that. It's just creating an awareness that a town hall will be um, available. So we can share, we can share that. Um, but if there's anything more than that, then I think that's when we would need that request, official request from the commission or as you as a, you know, a professor or the student organization can send it directly to our office. Okay, all right, <clears throat> I'll let them know. All right, all right, thanks. All right, well, thank you very much, commissioners. Thank you, Don, Terry, for, for, for being here. Um, so we have number item six is adjournment and just uh, our next community, our, our next uh, meeting will be August 10th at 5 p.m. So uh, we are adjourned. Uh, you, can't, you can't vote on it, but yeah, <laughs> you close the meeting. It's uh, 7.01. All right.
Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Have a good evening. Have a good night. Thank you. Good evening. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye, Denise. Thank you, Thelma. <laughs>